had we developed our manufacturing sector and industrialized a long time ago, we wouldn't be talking about leapfrogging from no industry to digital industry. Africa is the least industrialized continent in the world, and most things that have to be manufactured are imported. Many voices state that the fact that Africa has so many natural resources is actually one thing that kept them from building a well-established manufacturing sector. My name is Antonia Lorenz, and this is the Foundality Africa podcast. Our guest in today's episode is an advocate of industrialization in Africa. In his early life, he wanted to become an astronaut and studied aeronautical engineering in the UK. Now, he has built a company focused on biodiesel and soap production in his home country Zambia. And he has been honored with titles like Forbes 30 under 30. I'm happy to introduce Mutoban Goma, founder of Tapera Industries. My name is Mutoban Goma. I am I'm from Zambia. I run a, a small business in the renewable energy and natural products space. Uh, right now, we are more focused on uh, soap production from natural products, uh, vegetable oils, and we also still consult in the biofuels sector for the mm -hmm. country. Mutoba will tell us about his journey and inspiration for building a biodiesel company and how he thought it could turn around his country and why he then had to pivot. He also told us how he felt about being honored internationally, his advice about building a manufacturing business in Africa, and why this is so important. To understand his journey, let's start with his early life. I went to primary school in Zambia. Later in my teen year, teenage years, my family moved to Kenya because my father worked in Kenya. So I went to, I did my high school in Kenya until I completed in 2002. And then uh, in 2002, I moved to the United Kingdom to go and uh, study aircraft engineering. That already sounded very interesting to me. Why was he interested in aircraft engineering? When growing up, I was always fascinated by space movies. You know, all the Star Treks and the Star Wars, Thunderbirds, that used to really inspire me. Mm -hmm. So I think my mind became more one-tracked. And the fact that my father was an airline pilot, you know, got to travel around the world, made me excited around planes and travel. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really used to look forward to going into space when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So when uh, I finished school, high school, in fact, when I was still in high school, I used to talk about the career I wanted to take up was an astronaut. So I thought that the only path that would lead to that would be to become an aeronautical engineer mm -hmm. so that I would find my way to NASA and maybe space. <laughs> so <laughs> I always worked towards that goal. But how did he even get to the university in the UK? Oh, uh, basically, I just applied <laughs> after <laughs> finishing college. Mm -hmm. I applied, I, I applied uh, to study there, mm -hmm. and they thought uh, I qualified. And so that's how my father flew me to the UK to go and study there. Soon, however, he realized that in order to become an astronaut, studying aeronautic engineering would only be the first step of many, and it would only become more difficult. But unfortunately, while there in my first year, I started looking at my eligibility to be part of the space exploration institutions over there. But they were not very optimistic of my chances into entering those kind of institutions. And so I sort of just like forgot about it at that point. <laughs> yeah, because I thought, well, at least, at least it has taken me far enough to, to just go and study. Yeah. But yeah, uh, because of what they, yeah, their response was that because I was coming from a country without uh, any interest in space exploration, mm -hmm. there's a very small chance that I would be accepted in any program. So that's how yeah. I just thought about it. 
Becoming an astronaut was his dream. He even went to a different country to study. And all that just to hear that it wasn't possible? Couldn't he have pushed harder? Academically, I followed it through, mm -hmm. but I, I felt that trying to, like I could have really championed for like, for all uh, non non uh, space exploration com uh, countries to be included, you know, but mm -hmm. I thought about it like I was not very keen on taking up a fight, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Let me focus on uh, attainable goals for a person in a position. Mutoba figured it's not always worth to take the hard route. And he still had a finished engineering degree, gained international experience, and it was during that time where he discovered a problem that could also be a huge opportunity back in Zambia. I started doing research before I came back to Zambia as to what other opportunities I can take up. It is when I came across the, the fuel shortages in the country. In the mid-2000s, I think from early on, there was an annual shutdown of the, the country's oil refinery. And during that time, they would uh, allow other companies to bring in uh, finished fuels from abroad at very high prices. You know, that's when I saw that. Oh, so I can actually participate in bridging the gap between fuel shortages and fuel supply in the country through production of biodiesel. And his fascination with this topic was very grounded and well thought out. Here are his reasons why he thought this was a huge opportunity, not only for him, but also for the entire country of Zambia. I was thinking about how everything that the modern world does Everything, basically for the last 200 years, is based on energy. Mm -hmm. And the cheaper the energy, the bigger the progress. We import uh, 100% of all the fuel that is used in the country. So that means that we are subject to external market forces more than anyone, especially that we're a landlocked country. So our fuel has to come by ship and then get on a train mm -hmm. and then get on uh, a truck. You know, so there's so many hurdles. By the time it reaches the consumer, it's very expensive. And to make his country thrive, he knew he also had to involve the hundreds of thousands of small-scale farmers. Here's the impact that his solution was supposed to have. The small-scale farmers would be producing a biofuel crop that I can process into biodiesel and then distribute to all the industries and the transport sector. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that the small-scale rural farmers who do not have much livelihood from the, from the maize cash crops, which have got low value, mm -hmm. will benefit from an additional crop that can become a cash crop and cheaper to, to cultivate so that that money that is externalized every year which goes towards the oil marketing giants, mm -hmm. some of it would end up in the rural communities who are growing these energy crops. So I thought that I'd be tackling the agriculture sector to help uplift it by empowering the small-scale farmers and then also reduce the cost of uh, energy for local industries, transporters, you know, mm -hmm. and so that just, just, to, just to keep the economy thriving and also keep the money into, in the economy as long as yeah. possible. At that point, Mutoba was just 21 years old. Still, he already thought about how to not just build a business, but how to impact his country in the best possible way. What experiences gave him such a broad perspective? I think my experience Bosia, living in the UK and also living in Kenya, mm -hmm. gave me a different perspective of what we needed as a country, as Zambia, because growing up in Zambia, economy-wise, it's not very advanced. It's uh, highly polarized. You know, there's a few rich people and a lot of poor people. It's unfortunate enough to see both sides. I've got rich relatives and very poor relatives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can, I, and I see the disparities between the two. 
so he was exposed to different ways of life early on. And he had always been given an explanation that just wasn't resonating with what he thought was right. Often the case that was brought out was that the ones who were very educated are the rich ones, and the ones who did not go to school are the poor ones. You know, that was a narrative that was being taught to us, go to school if you don't want to be poor. But then when I lived in Kenya, there was a different scenario I saw. The people are very educated, but the ones who are not very educated still have a chance at success, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. So you'll find a tea farmer is wealthy without an education. They are given the same opportunities to develop other modes of income. Mm-hmm. Whereas here it was, if you're a farmer, it's because you failed at school, yeah. so you become a farmer. Mm-hmm. But not realizing that without the farmer, there'll be no food, there'll be yeah. no, a, lot, a lot of things mm-hmm. would not be available. Mutoba highly disagreed with the current narrative. For a country to thrive, everyone in the economy has to be valued and it has to be made sure that it is not fully dependent on external forces. He knew something has to be done and he has to be the one that does it. Which brings us to our next topic, developing Tapera Industries' vision and bringing the company to life. How did the idea develop? What were the things Mutoba did and who else was involved? It all started with the documentation he saw on CNN. I actually saw it on CNN. Coincidentally, I just saw Mm -hmm. this documentary talking about how Brazil has developed the sugarcane industry for ethanol production to supply so that their cars can run on ethanol. Mm -hmm. Then I was thinking about it like, but in Zambia, we've got a lot of water a lot of land that's not utilized is just going to waste, mm-hmm. you know, being passed down generation to generation, but nothing being developed. Mm-hmm. And yet there's this opportunity whereby we can grow crops that can sustain the fuel supply in the country. I thought mm-hmm. about it. In Zambia, we've got so many great small-scale farmers, you know, Mm-hmm. They know how to plant anything. They can grow anything. But they, ha- they lack access to markets because they're in the rural areas with no roads. They lack knowledge because they're not exposed to what is happening 100 kilometers from them. So they don't know that there's opportunities to grow crops that can help the country as well as help themselves to develop. So mm-hmm. all those things I was thinking about, I said, if I could reach all these people, with this kind of knowledge, then we can actually create something big Mm -hmm. that can help the whole country. But how did he then start? Back then, he was still in the UK and finishing up his studies. But there was one special person who was his biggest supporter, his dad. When I was living in the UK, my dad used to visit often. As a pilot, he used to fly in every now and then. Mm-hmm. So I used to talk to him about these ideas. I used to talk about, hey, wait, can we do this? And my dad was very enthusiastic because he felt that I was talking about things that he used to think about. Because even nowadays, my dad uh, passed away about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. But people, when I talked to, talk to them about my ideas, and then people who knew him, they think that he told me what to say because what I talk about, about mm-hmm. uplift, uplifting people and whatnot, it's what he used to talk about all the time because it's something that was close to his heart. And, you know, he, he had all his relatives who were less fortunate and he felt that he could do more. And he just didn't know how. And so when I was giving him the ideas that I'd learned, he felt that he could back me. So his dad was both an inspiration and a huge support for Mutoba. He funded the business in the beginning, as well as helped grow it. These were the first steps they took. What we would do, would go around looking for anything that can help the biodiesel dream come true. 
So we would go around looking for uh, chemical supply companies. We went around looking for the same artisans who, who can take uh, instructions and build these contraptions. Like my first biodiesel reactor was built by this very experienced welder. I just told him what I wanted to do and he built it. And that's how we started making biodiesel. And then so from there, my father talked to his friends who had restaurants to say, you're used to cooking oil, we'll, we'll collect it for you for free. And that's how we started doing collecting the cooking oil and processing it into biodiesel, you know, and mm -hmm. just developing it slowly like that. Uh, most of the time I spent when I came back was just trying to set up the business and build a, build a base. The first thing I thought about when I came back is I have to produce biodiesel. The first thing before anything, mm -hmm. before I start thinking about expanding, even before I registered the business, I, said, I thought, let me produce biodiesel. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. how it started. Notice what Mutoba focused on. He knew that the core of his business was producing biodiesel. So after the research he did, that was the first thing he had to set up. And also building basic structures for the company was important to ensure they could grow the company efficiently. But of course, it wasn't always easy. And they faced some issues that also put them in front of a difficult situation later on. At that time, that was 2006, Zambia was still, let me say, industrially backward. Even having the, the equipment fabricated, it was not so easy because of trying to explain to someone who doesn't understand engineering on the level that I had at that time. But giving them insight into what I want to do, like the mixing and everything, then they understood and they, they caught up. And also the mindset of the society in Zambia was putting obstacles in Mutoba's way. Biodiesel in Zambia is still considered something very futuristic. You know, despite uh, I've produced a lot of biodiesel and sold to a lot of companies, but because I've not done it to a scale that people feel they can appreciate, so they still think it's just one of those things that you just like, well, you just appreciate from far away. You just say, oh, this mm -hmm. is really nice, it's cute, but not something that can be taken seriously. But how do you deal with such a backlash? And what does it do to a business? I understand the ignorance. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my country has got a very narrow perspective of the way things should be done. You know, the same systems that were being implemented in 1930 is what is still being implemented today. The implemented systems are very inflexible and outdated, even though Zambia does have a history with biodiesel. Here's how that worked out, and how knowing this helped Mutoba deal with the judgment. In the 70s, the first Republican president proposed uh, biofuels to sustain the economy. But because of the backward thinking of the majority of politicians and the people in influential positions, mm -hmm. it caused him to fail to the point that they thought he was going insane. But at the same time, that's when Brazil was implementing their biofuels they were not seeing that. They just felt that, no, it works in Brazil, but here it can't work. So, like, I, I don't blame anyone for being ignorant. I just, mm -hmm. I understand where it's coming from. What they know is what they've been taught at school, mm -hmm. and that's the gospel truth. And, yeah, so when people say, ah, no, this can't work, I just nod my head and shrug and move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? In the beginning... Selling the biodiesel wasn't enough to sustain the business. So Mutoba started working for a local airline and built the business along the way for a few years. He developed Tapera further and further. They supplied the transport industry and they were looking to also supply terrain and cement companies. But there was one problem which became more and more evident the further they expanded. The biggest hurdle was 
not having enough raw material, the vegetable oil was not readily available because yeah. we had outgrown the supply of raw material. Yeah, so it was right. It, it is. It became unsustainable. Which brings us to our next topic: Tepera Industries pivoting. Mutoba's whole business evolved around the dream of producing biodiesel. But it just wasn't sustainable, and Mutoba faced a decision similar to the one when he quit becoming an astronaut. Should he fight for his dream, or rather pivot, and dedicate himself to a new attainable challenge? By 2010, we said it developed an alternative product from the vegetable oils to make soap, natural soaps. So we were still holding on to the biodiesel dream, saying, no, biodiesel is going to work, and it's going mm -hmm. to change the whole country, it's going to bring in the money. But by 2011, we saw that it would not work because that's when um, the fuel, like the fossil fuel sector, uh, got subsidized. What happened was that it became cheaper to buy fossil fuel than to buy biodiesel. Yeah, uh, we said, look, uh, there's no point in holding on. Let's, let's, let's maintain biodiesel, but let's focus more on hygiene now. Mm -hmm. So we changed. So what were his reasons? And how did he feel back then, giving up on his dream? For maybe a year, it was hard because I was thinking, ah, I can't stop this. I need to maintain, I need to push it forward. But the thing is, I needed to make a plan because it had been about almost two years since I lost my job and I needed to start earning some money. Mm -hmm. So it made more sense to make soap, which was readily taken up by the community than buy diesel that, you know, just so many hurdles. Mm -hmm. So with, with the soap, it was straightforward. People want to bath with a good soap and we can uh, supply it to them at a good price. And that was done. <laughs> <laughs> For a few years, Tapera still made biodiesel on request. Now they have almost let go of it completely. There were just too many political issues around it. This was a huge step, considering the work he put in and also the international attention he got for it. So first of all, I was wondering how he got listed and honored by Forbes, the UN and so on for his commitment to biodiesel and also how letting go despite that felt. I, I was as surprised as you are. <laughs> <laughs> Because I honestly didn't think anyone was paying attention. I was just working basically. I was, I was just doing my thing. I, mm -hmm. like, I genuinely just wanted the biodiesel to work. I didn't know that it was something that people would actually be wishing to happen as well. Mm -hmm. So when I got those uh, accolades, I was very touched and very humbled. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, like at a certain point, I had to start thinking about my future. You can, you can get well into your old age, hoping that, that uh, you'll be able to feed your family based on hard work, but <laughs> it doesn't always work out like that. Mm -hmm. So the best is just to find ways to make it work. Uh, you know, like there's, there's other people in the biofuel sector that are still struggling to make it work and they have had to go back into employment just to sustain their vision. Mm -hmm. But I decided that instead of going back into employment, I'm going to change the direction of the company to keep it sustainable. However, Mutoba's dream wasn't just to produce biodiesel, but to help the environment and to support small-scale farmers. And this is something they can still focus on now. Because we still do a lot of good in the hygiene sector. Uh, since we're producing natural products, we are actually still helping the environment by reducing the amount of phosphates that ends up in the, in the rivers uh, from the chemical soaps. Mm -hmm. So we felt that maybe let's focus on that more than 
than uh, the biofuels, which is still is still limping, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, even when we produce the soap, we are still helping the small scale farmers who are producing the crops to make the oil. We are still maintaining the the, the value chains. We are still still reducing the amount of imported products in the same line. Next up, manufacturing. Mutoba explains the reason why Africa has such an underdeveloped manufacturing sector, why he thinks leapfrogging might not be the solution for everything, and how African entrepreneurs can get into this sector. Mutoba was fortunate to attend international conferences and meetings regarding this topic. And one statement from such a meeting really stuck with him. Any, any country that needs to progress has to industrialize. The person that said it best is the former World Bank head. He was very, very bold. And how he described it was like when South Korea came out of the war, they were basically a decimated island. And they went to the World Bank to ask for help. But they were declined because they didn't have any natural resources that the World Bank thought was valuable. Mm -hmm. So as a people, they came together and started looking at things that they can do locally to save on costs of importing. By doing so, they developed the light industry. Through that, they graduated to the medium industries. Then from the medium industries, they graduated to the heavy industry, the fridges, the Samsung, you know, all those yeah. cars and whatnot. And then from the heavy industry, they're now in the digital industry. So they went stage by stage, developing over the last 50 to 60 years into what is now known as South Korea. On the other side, there's Africa, full of natural resources like gold and copper. And the World Bank was happy to give them loans, because if all fails, they still have the resources to pay them back. However, without having the urge to develop manufacturing and being politically crippled by colonialism, this is how the situation played out. We were supposed to be mining that copper and even on a very small scale, at least produce copper wire. But because we did not even think about developing our light industries, we let all our minerals go. So it meant that we ended up not being able to develop. Natural resources are a great start. But the problem is that they are not endless, and just trading them doesn't build structures. That's why value addition through manufacturing is crucial for any country. And as Mutoba says, also leapfrogging won't solve this problem. Had we developed our manufacturing sector and industrialized a long time ago, we wouldn't be talking about leapfrogging from no industry to digital industry. That's why I think manufacturing is so important because it is the backbone to any credible economy. Without a manufacturing sector, there's nothing that a country can do mm -hmm. uh, to progress. It yeah. will always be a poor country without a manufacturing sector. When it comes to manufacturing, Africa needs to catch up. But how can you do this? Here is Mutoba's advice for entrepreneurs. I always tell people to look for things that are within their skill set, you know, because uh, you will not do something that you're not interested in. A lot of people say, ah, oh, no, I want to do biodiesel. They're fascinated. They look at my lifestyle. They think, okay, he's got cars, he's got his own warehouse, he's got mm -hmm. a house. So maybe it's something that he can do and also live com comfortably. Mm -hmm. But they don't understand that there's actually work that goes into that. <laughs> you know, yeah. It has to come from somewhere. It's not just, it didn't just happen. And all the time, and when people come to me saying they want to buy diesel, I, I always encourage them. And the first thing I tell them is, are you interested in paying consultancy fees? I spent years going to internet cafes, talking to industry experts and consulting everywhere about how to do it. I understand it's not about the money, you know, sometimes it's just about the knowledge, mm -hmm. but 
I feel that people who are willing to pay, they'll take that knowledge seriously. So it is really important to start with something you enjoy doing and are interested in. Here is an example of what that could also look like. Maybe make functional art, like nice looking chairs, nice looking beds, nice looking doors, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Paint, 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 paint the streets the way you see it, where people, the way people will appreciate it mm -hmm. and get them to buy it, you know, things like that. So mm -hmm. always go for something that you're already passionate about. So apart from what your own passion is, what industries should be tackled first? Well, almost any, but we have to start small. So if we can start developing small industries that can support big industries, it would actually help us a lot. Mm -hmm. Carpets, a lot of carpets come from the Middle East, fake carpets, mm -hmm. because from uh, places like Japan, it's too expensive. So we get fake things from the Middle East mm -hmm. and we put them in our cars and two months later, that part is dead. Why can't we develop in a, an industry that can maybe even make the same fake car parts but at a cheaper price so that we stop externalizing all the money that we have and be, uh, be left with nothing? And lastly, what is Mutoba's vision for Africa? I feel that we have so much potential, but we are easily deluded by glittery things. You know, we are easily told that we 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 don't we don't have to work hard to get what we need to survive. I don't know if you have ever heard of miracle money. Nowadays, everybody's obsessed with miracle money. That if you just pray hard, you get the money. My vision would be to get everybody to embrace industrialization. Whatever small thing anybody can make, make it. We'll find a market for it. Right now, we have a saga in Zambia about gold mining. I always remind people that the gold rush in America happened without tools. It was just a bunch of men going down, digging out the gold and cleaning it. Mm -hmm. So if we take up that kind of attitude, like we can actually build this continent with our bare hands, then we'll be in a much better position. That's it for this episode of the Fondality Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked this episode, subscribe and don't miss out when we upload new ones. Please also share and leave a review if you want others to know about Foundality. If you want to know more about us, or if you want to leave us a message, visit foundality.com. Also, if you know an outstanding African entrepreneur who you think could be a great guest, please let us know. We do post small snippets, learnings and inspirations from the podcast on social media. You can find us under the name Foundality. Episodes will be uploaded weekly. See you then.